So this is a kidney cancer talk, which is now in the wrong section. But basically, um, what I'm going to do is, let's see, I'm going to look at the time here. Okay. Uh, we're going to work on uh, talking about a few of the research uh, items that we're doing. So this is a little bit of a buffet to just give you a little taste of some of the stuff that we're doing at Baylor in terms of kidney cancer research. And I'll try to put it a little bit into a clinical perspective so it's not too basic science-y for you. Um, so kidney cancer, obviously very common, 65,000 new cases in 2018, about 15,000 deaths, and five-year survival, about 75%. If you look globally, you can see a couple of trends. Incidence is increasing. Perhaps that's related to more imaging, but it's probably more than that. And generally, mortality is slightly decreasing unless you live in Bulgaria, which I don't understand, but don't live in Bulgaria if you get this particular problem. Everybody else is doing better. Um, urologists, we see a ton of renal tumors. Most of them are smaller or tumors that are localized to the kidney. And we generally attack these now with minimally invasive techniques and perform nephron sparing surgery in the vast majority. We've seen a change in the standard of care for treatment of this from radical nephrectomy for everyone to partial nephrectomy only for absolute necessity to partial nephrectomies for most T1A tumors to essentially elective partial nephrectomy for all resectable T1 tumors in patients not suitable for surveillance. And if you look at tertiary referral centers, you see about 85% uh, are being done with partial nephrectomy at this point. There are some challenges, though, in teaching that, and, and uh, Dr. Sony talked about that a little bit yesterday. You know, when we do this robotically, we lose uh, control over several portions of the procedure to our trainees who might be at the bedside and during that procedure. There's time pressure during vascular clamping. There's some complex anatomic relationships that are not obvious to beginners uh, from imaging. If they get into trouble or make mistakes, these can be a little bit harder to recover from without costs to the patient, both in blood loss and warm ischemia time. And we're doing harder and harder tumors this way. So it creates some educational challenges. How do we get people to progress from the beginning to the end of this process in an efficient way? Well, you know, does the airline take their junior pilots and just throw them in the cockpit and let them fly you between your destinations? Does that seem like a common sense approach? Nah, that's not what they do, but that's what we do, right? We take, pay, take our residents and we put them on the console and we let them fly, basically, which is not ideal. What the, what the uh, airline does is they put people in simulators for quite a long time before they go on and do their actual flying. Um, and if you look at the digital revolution in surgery, particularly in, in robotics, there are a lot of opportunities to enhance our training and to make this process a little bit more like how we train airline pilots and a little bit less like how we train surgeons. Keep in mind also that subtle anatomic variations in nephron sparing robotic partial nephrectomy you know, can make a big difference in the degree of difficulty of the procedure and in its efficiency. So again, we look at all these tumors. Some of these are going to be straightforward and some of them are going to have long warm ischemia times and lots of blood loss in, in the beginner's hands. So the beginner has to look at these on a CT scan and do a bunch of things mentally. They have to construct a mental 3D image of the anatomy of the tumor. They've got to figure out what's the degree of difficulty and predict warm ischemia duration in their hands, which can be a little bit difficult early on. And they've got to plan an effective and efficient surgical approach. So how do we teach this without just unleashing them? Well, dual console systems are a great adjunct. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not all rainbows and unicorns with dual console sim, uh, systems. First of all, you need a third person at the bedside. And very frequently, we don't have a third person to stand at the bedside who can assist in these cases. Uh, the robot has lessened that manual dexterity component of the procedure uh, as compared to laparoscopy, but it hasn't changed their ability to visualize where the tumor is located and to come up with a strategy to get to it in an efficient, safe manner. Um, so this is not the perfect solution. So I'm going to touch on three projects today. Two are going to be related to this topic. Um, we're looking at can we use uh, new technologies like 3D printing and volumetric reconstruction to help train people or to help perhaps do pre-surgical rehearsal for complex cases. So we can take CT images and convert them into uh, 3D uh, uh, volumetrically rendered models. We can manipulate those models. So for example, if you want to remove the tumor, you can look in and see what's at the bottom of the tumor. It's not as easy to do that in your brain just from looking at a triphasic CT. We can generate uh, manipulable three-dimensional images that you can study in advance of your procedure. 
We can also turn those 3D volumetric reconstructions into physical models. So that can be a physical model like this that just allows you to handle the, the kidney. And th this is a patient-specific tumor model, so it's relevant to the patient you're operating on. And then we've collaborated with a group called Lazarus 3D and have come up with a system to convert these into a soft material that's, that simulates uh, parenchyma for the kidney. So you can actually make a soft model of the kidney with the patient's tumor that you can then operate on prior to operating on the patient. So this is just an example of that. Here we have a patient's model and then the patient's surgery. And as you zip along in this, you can see that it's a very similar, uh, without the bleeding, a very similar uh, mechanism to practice resection of that tumor. Again, this is a patient-specific uh, process. So we did a study looking at this. We had a series of patients that we imaged. We reconstructed their kidneys, printed them in silicone, cast them to make these flexible models. On the day of the patient's surgery, I resected these, uh, the model first, and then immediately resected the uh, tumor on the kidney. And we then laser scanned the specimens from both the model and the kidney tumor. Uh, and this shows that there's fairly good fidelity of this model. So if you look at the time of resection, time of, of tumor resection, very similar between the model and the patient, not much difference. Uh, if you look at the specimens, uh, you can see that we're resecting a very similar shape and volume of specimen in the, in the model and in the patient. Again, if you look at what the computer predicted, what we resected in the model and what we resected in the patient, they're very similar. So this shows that uh, this is a fairly high fidelity model. I do think that using this to pre-surgically rehearse very complex cases, even for experts, can be very valuable. I definitely changed my approach to several of these patients during this study after doing the resection of their original uh, model. And I think there's some value in this approach uh, in training trainees, particularly in a patient-specific manner. So what about virtual reality simulation? Um, can we throw goggles on people and get avoid all this making of 3D models? Um, well, maybe this is the future. Obviously, when we're doing things robotically, we have access to simulators. Um, we wanted to study this mostly from the standpoint of how to teach people to visualize the tumor and its relationship to adjacent structures and, and structures in the kidney. Um, so what we did is we selected three patients with different tumor locations. We 3D reconstructed these built models, and then integrated them into a simulator. This is a simulator made by Mimix, uh, and we collaborated with them on this project. Uh, and you can see the physically printed versions of these uh, models. So these are not particularly huge tumors, but they were in different locations. We then created a random selection of 3D printed models, placing the tumor randomly in different portions of the kidney, some close to the original tumor model and some far away from that model. We then randomized in a prospective multi-center trial, 100 medical students who had uh, no experience doing this. 50% uh, of these got to look at the CT scan and then got to spend five minutes just playing with this on a simulator. The other 50 uh, had no access to the simulator. And then they had to choose between the nine models and we quantified how close they were to the location of the actual tumor. And what we found was that there was a very dramatic improvement in that person's ability to identify the tumor, the correct tumor, in the model as opposed to the person that did not have access to the simulator. And this was only five minutes of exposure to the simulator. So I think this provides some potential uh, evidence to suggest that use of simulators, much like what's done in the airline industry, is going to help us to improve the learning curve in this procedure. So for the last section of this, I'm going to switch uh, gears rather abruptly. I'm going to talk about engineering an animal model for papillary renal cell carcinoma. So, you know, urologists, we're winning the war on kidney cancer, right? I mean, we take our patients to the operating room, we remove their tumors, and 90-plus percent of them do well. So we're all doing great. Unfortunately, that's not quite true. As, uh, as Dr. Sony mentioned yesterday, only about uh, two-thirds of the patients that we see present with localized disease. And for the patients that present with distant disease, they have an abysmal survival rate. So five-year survival for patients with distant disease at presentation is only 12%. So that makes us a little bit sad. You know, it's been an amazing decade in renal cell carcinoma. and We've seen this uh, progression of new targeted agents that's exploded over the last decade, making a nice toolbox. But the toolbox looks a little more like this at the moment. 
Uh, it's a bit of a mess. We really don't know which agents to use at what time and in what patients. Uh, and it's a difficult question to answer because some of these uh, tumor subtypes are not common and it's difficult to run these clinical trials. So we need a better understanding of which tools to use, when to use them singly and in combination, and perhaps, perhaps um, have some new tools. And this is particularly true in the non-clear cell renal cell carcinoma cases if we're going to affect this, this terrible number. So targeted therapy depends on an understanding of the genes involved in renal cell carcinoma tumor genesis and progression and the pathways involved in that as well. So how do we figure that out? Well, one way to figure out how a car accident happens is to do something we'll call forensic genetics. This is what the, text, the TCGA does. Um, what they do is they go out and they have a hypothesis. They think, well, maybe the mirror was the problem. Maybe that's what caused the accident. So let's go out and sequence all the tumors that we find. Turns out you have to sequence a lot of tumors uh, to find uh, a decent statistical analysis. And perhaps out of all these car crashes, a subset have a broken mirror. But perhaps only a very small subset of that subset was the mirror the cause of the accident. So you can see how trying to identify causality here is going to require a huge effort in terms of tumor uh, sequencing. Um, and what you get are things like this. This is an example from chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. Uh, you get a cloud of small frequency events and a few higher frequency events, but none that are ubiquitous across all tumors. And so how do you interpret this? How do we know which of these is really responsible or which combination is responsible? Which should we be targeting for our treatment? That makes it a little bit difficult. Okay, also remember there's tremendous tumor heterogeneity, intratumor heterogeneity. So the TCGA is sampling primarily just a single focus of these tumors and multiple foci within the tumor have different genetic mutation profiles. So we've got a little bit of a problem there. We've also got multiple subtypes of renal cell carcinoma, uh, which can cloud this as well. So an alternative is to do something called functional genetics. So instead of doing this approach of just sequencing a million tumors, why don't we just break the mirror in a bunch of, uh, of kidneys and send these out into the, into the uh, highway and see which ones crash. Maybe we break a few other things at the same time. Um, this gives us a little bit more of a causal versus a correlational link to an outcome. And this is what we'd like to be able to do in renal cell carcinoma. I'm going to focus today specifically on papillary renal cell carcinoma. Why? Well, first of all, the, ma the vast majority of research is in the clear cell category. Um, papillary renal cell carcinoma research tools are really sorely lacking, and we don't really know how to treat these patients. And so this is a, an area where it's very clinically relevant. It's 15% of all the uh, RCC cases, but there's a lot of variation in papillary as a subtype. Lots of histologic variation and a lot of mutational variation. And these particular uh, variants behave differently. The problem is we don't have m any model systems for papillary renal cell carcinoma. We don't have any animal models for the disease, and we have very few cell-based resources. Xenografts uh, from papillary renal cell carcinoma patients have very poor take rate, less than 15%, uh, and have to be grafted into immunodeficient animals, which can be an issue. Why, do, why does that matter? So what is a PDX? So here's an example of a human tumor that's harvested, injected into either orthotopically or into the flank of a mouse, and then you can passage these tumors through the mouse. The problem is that only a small proportion of them actually take in PDX models, and usually they tend to be the more uh, nasty tumors, the ones that are more de-differentiated. And then when they go off into the dish for manipulation, when they come back to the animal, they may not be the same. They may not be as good a model for the human disease. So this is not ideal. We can do this very nicely with cell lines. This is an example where we've taken human cell lines with renal cell carcinoma and just injected them into the flank of immunodeficient animals. And you can make nice tumors that look a lot like the human uh, counterparts. Uh, again, but these are transformed cell, line, cell lines from clear cell. So what would we love if we could get the best possible model? Well, we'd like a genetically engineered mouse that we could use for in vitro and in vivo work. We'd like to have accelerated mutagenesis because these mice don't live to be 70 years of age and we don't live to be 170. So we'd like to have something tumor-wise before we retire. Um, we want this to be kidney-specific, highly penetrant, predictable in onset, and ideally some trackable mutation so we could go back and reverse engineer what happened, what caused the tumors. Uh, and again, we'd like to see papillary renal cell carcinoma in these models. And 
This is a long sausage making exercise, which I'm not going to show you today. Um, but basically, just in, we've accomplished this goal by doing the following three things. So we've made an activating mutation of the MET proto-oncogene and an inactivating mutation of the P10 tumor suppressor gene. And then we've combined that with something called the Sleeping Beauty transposon. So why did we do that? Well, there's a familial form of papillary renal cell carcinoma uh, that is out there, was originally identified in the 1990s. Genetic analysis of these, even back in the 1990s, showed that all of these patients had uh, germline mutations in their MET proto-oncogene, usually in the tyrosine kinase domain. In addition, Cowden syndrome, uh, which represents a heterozygous loss of P10, which is a tumor suppressor gene, has about a 36% risk of renal cell carcinoma, and the majority of those renal cell carcinomas are papillary. So that puts P10 into the perspective. If you knock P10 out completely in mice, though, they don't get kidney cancer. Uh, P10 AKT signaling, which is uh, genetically altered in Cowden syndrome, is seen in about 28% of uh, sporadic renal cell carcinoma cases as well, and they all share the same uh, role in this pathway. So we have got to talk a little briefly about salmon. What is the transposon system? We'll think about it. I'm from Texas, so it's a, kind of like a gun and bullets, right? So the gun is a transposase, which is an enzyme that came out of salmon, uh, which fires the bullets, and the bullets are this long concatenator of transposons that are oncogenic. So these things are like bullets that can drop into the genome, and activate or deactivate genes. Ideally, we'd like to turn on this gun in the kidney only. We don't really want to create a whole bunch of patients with the spleen tumors or lung tumors. We just want kidney tumors. So we've done this by using a particular form of pre recombinase. I won't go into why we do that. But what it does is it allows us to turn on these genes only in the kidney and a little bit in the liver. So the other organs don't have them. We've made a mouse using homologous recombination that has this activating form of MET, so it's a constitutively active form of MET, the same one that's seen in papillary renal cell carcinoma families. And it turns out that when you do that, the mice are viable and fertile, and they don't have much of a phenotype, not too surprising. Um, if you look at the mice before you activate them or you activate them, they make a lot of transcript for MET, but they process the transcript normally down to normal levels. Um, what does this do? Well, when we activate these mice, the normal Three prime end of the gene gets converted for the one that we've created that has uh, this mutation that activates the gene, and now it only makes that activated form. They make the same amount of protein as they do before activation, so we're not altering the amount of protein that's made. It's still regulated properly by the cell. And then if we look at activation in these mice, wild-type mice and non-activated MET mice have no real evidence of phosphorylated MET. So this is the activated form of MET. It's a phosphorylated receptor. When you activate them with decree, they get a very compelling activation. If you look at downstream markers by a reverse phase protein array, again, MET about the same as a normal mouse, phosphorylated MET threefold higher, and then downstream signaling events from phosphorylated MET are even higher, sixfold higher. So these mice do what we're supposed to do, but they don't have a phenotype. So our workflow is to take these mice, add the P10 mutation I discussed, and then set off that gun inside their kidneys. And when we do that, thankfully, we get tumors. So we get large tumors in the kidneys. This is that we monitor these mice by MRI. And again, when you take these kidneys out, they get multiple tumors uh, on both kidneys by about six months of age. When you look at the histology of these tumors, they do look like papillary renal cell carcinoma. We've looked at about 50 uh, at this point, and essentially 95% of them are papillary renal cell carcinomas. These mice get their tumors by about six months of age, usually by about eight, nine months. Uh, they have multiple tumors of significant volume that we can uh, assess. Um, the mice that do not have the transposon activated do not seem to get any tumors. MET is not absolutely required for this, pr this process, um, but it greatly accelerates it. So if you don't have MET, they still get tumors, but it takes a year or plus to get them. If you have the MET present, then they go much faster. And again, the ones that have, uh, the, the tumors lose their other copy of P10. This is just an immunohistochemistry showing normal P10 in adjacent tissue and no P10 in the tumors. 
And again, when we look at them by RNA expression, again, I'm going through this quickly, but just to get the overriding points, they cluster together as tumors, and they look different than the wild type. And if you look at AKT signaling, which I mentioned earlier, the tumors have dramatically increased, increased AKT signaling versus benign adjacent tissue versus the wild type. And I'm going to jump through this for sake of time. Okay. So what are we doing with these mice currently? Well, there's really three future directions. We're characterizing these models histologically with expression and immune profiling. We're looking at gene discovery for these models. Remember, these are tagged mutations, so we can go back and figure out what happened in the car accident and what caused the accident. So we're in the midst of doing that now. And then we're using these models to do preclinical trials of new uh, papillary renal cell carcinoma therapies. So take home messages, we talked about 3D reconstruction and 3D printing and showed that this was a fairly high fidelity model for teaching uh, these uh, partial nephrectomy procedures. We talked a little bit about virtual simulation uh, and how it might play a role in teaching learners. And I showed you some evidence that we've developed the first genetically engineered mouse model for papillary renal cell carcinoma and are using it in this process of doing functional gene discovery. Thank you very much. <laughs>